In today's video, we're going to append values to a list of integers by using a custom reducer. So here's today's plan. First, we're going to create a simple graph that will hold a list of Fibonacci numbers. The state graph will use type dict and it will consist of a single Fibonacci key with an initial value of a list zero. The Fibonacci reducer function will update the state by appending the provided integer to the end of the list. The developer node will be a no-op. We'll add memory to the graph in order to retrieve the state at any point. Then we'll draw a visualization using Mermaid. Next, we're going to utilize Langsmith to trace the execution of the graph and monitor state changes. Finally, we'll run the graph and print the results. Now let's take a look at some of the important code snippets for our graph. The first one is our state definition, and it uses type dict and annotated from typing to define a list of integers and a reducer as a second parameter. The reducer will be a simple Python function, which will take the current list and a new value and return the appended list. We will also dedupe and sort the output so we have a neat list. The developer node in this case will have no role. It will just be a no-op and return the state as is. However, feel free to edit the node and modify the state as you wish. The edge definitions are rather simple too. We have a start, developer, and end nodes with a simple flow from beginning to the end. Finally, our chatbot, a while loop taking user input and running the graph. Every time the user responds, the graph will run and the reducer will add a new Fibonacci number to the list. The loop will terminate when the user hits Q or types quit. Okay, it's time now to jump into Visual Studio and start coding. Once in Visual Studio code, create a new file and name it state.py. First, here's what we're going to create today. Next, we're going to get our imports. Once we have our imports, it's time to create our first utility function. This function Fibonacci will take an integer as a parameter and return the next Fibonacci number. Next, we're going to define our reducer. This function will serve as our custom reducer inside the state. Once we have our reducer, it's time to define our state. Now, let's define our graph. The graph is a very simple object, and now it's time to define our first node, which is our developer node. Now we're going to add this node to the graph. Once this is added to the graph, now we can set the entry point and the end point. Now let's define our configuration and the memory. Once we have the configuration and the memory, let's compile our graph. As you can see here, while we compile the graph, we pass the memory as our check pointer. Let's provide the initial state and run our graph. We're invoking the graph with our initial value Fibonacci zero, and then with our config object. Let's draw a picture of our graph. Finally, let's run our chatbot. As you can see, this is a very simple loop and it expects user input. And when the input is one of quit, exit, or Q, the loop will end. Beyond that, it will invoke the graph with the Fibonacci and the next Fibonacci number. Let's save our file now and run it. I'm going to run this in the integrated terminal. Open the integrated terminal and type python state.py. And as soon as I run this, the first state is being passed zero, and this is the state it is returned by the reducer. For the next invocation, I'll just hit enter. And as you can see, the next Fibonacci number is set as one, and it's zero and one. So the next one, of course, will be one because it's the sum of the first two. And because we're returning a set, it will return the same result effectively. But the next one will be a two, three, five, eight, and so on and so forth. As you can see, every time I execute the loop, the graph runs and our reducer returns a new list with the last Fibonacci number appended to the end of the list. Now, if I hit Q, this will terminate the loop. Okay, so this is the app. This is a good time to introduce Langsmith, a tracing tool from Langchain, allowing detailed logging and monitoring of graph executions. This includes the monitoring of the state variables. In order to set up Langsmith, we need to define and export three environment variables. These are Langsmith Tracing V2, Langsmith Endpoint, and Langchain API Key. You can get your free Langchain API Key from their site by navigating to your profile settings and then API Keys. Once you have the keys defined and exported, let's look at how to use Langsmith. Once logged into Langsmith, feel free to explore the interface. On the left side, you will see your projects, your queues, your deployments, data sets, and settings. You can get your API keys from the settings tab, but for now, I'll just navigate to projects. And if I click on the default project, on this main pane, 
you see your traces. I can minimize this left side. These are expandable. And here I see my start node. And here I can see my developer node in the middle section here is your state. And it displays both the input and the rendered output. Here's my start node and here's my developer node. And here's the state during the input, and this is the state rendered at the output stage. What I'd like to do here is to start a new execution of our script and go back and forth between Visual Studio and Langsmith so that you can monitor and see how variables are changing and how nodes are being executed and how Langsmith is helping you trace your application flow. I will go back to Visual Studio code and run the script one more time. Okay, so this was first invocation of our graph with the first initial number of zero. If we go back, you will see immediately the timestamp of the execution and LangGraph will tell you which nodes executed with what value. Let's go ahead and execute our second number and just monitor LangSmith. As you can see, immediately the input was one and the output was zero one as the list. The developer node didn't do anything, but the graph itself, the reducer, took that input of one and produced the list of zero and one. Let's go and execute it again. So this effectively is another execution of the graph, but the output will be the same. And we're gonna go and do it one more time. And now our output in the state is zero, one, and two. Sometimes it does take a little while for the updates to trickle down. But as you can see, the input to the graph is two. This is the next Fibonacci number. And the rendered output or the state for the Fibonacci as it's stored in the state object is 0, 1, and 2 integers in a list. Uh, we can keep doing this several more times and let's go up to 144. And here back to Lang Smith, it keeps increasing with the various inputs as they're passed by the graph. Rendered output captures the state. There are many different ways you can take advantage of Lang Smith. Uh, you can filter here by various aspects of your graph. I'd like to show you one, for example, is you can filter by thread ID. If you remember, we use thread ID here to configure our graph. Here, our thread ID is one, and I can filter this by thread ID is equal to one, and then it's going to display only those with thread ID one. Of course, I have prior executions. It shows the entire execution. But if you want to filter this just by this execution, you can change this to any number you'd like, like 100 or 1,000, and then filter by that, and you'll see only that execution. As mentioned, there are many different ways to filter the inputs. Uh, you can obviously delete the traces or start a new one. But Langsmith provides a great way to trace our values inside the graph, to trace the executions, which node is executing what, and what are the changes to the state after those executions. Back to Visual Studio. And now we can quit our loop. OK, I hope you found this interesting and helpful. In a short period of time, we've managed to create a custom reducer and use Langsmith to trace our app. Now that you're seeing another way of using state, go ahead and explore more use cases and write your own reducers. These skills will come in handy once we move on to more complex flows. In future videos, we'll look into nodes and edges, but for today, this is a wrap. I hope you enjoyed watching this tutorial and you learned something new. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Please let me know in the comment section what topics are of interest to you, and I will try to make a tutorial for them. Thank you for watching.